I spent a lot of time studying people like David Buss, and Buss is a very good example, an evolutionary psychologist, and I like David's work a lot. I think he's a very solid scientist, and there's been a lot of interesting work generated out of the evolutionary psychology literature on the gender relations front. So, for example, one of the more compelling findings from the evolutionary psychologists is the relationship between perceived sexual attractiveness, particularly in the long-term mating context, and socioeconomic status. Now, it's probably not socioeconomic status as indexed by wealth. It's probably wealth as an index of productive competence. But in any case, the correlation between perceived mate attractiveness uh, with regards to women perceiving men, the correlation between socioeconomic status and perceived attractiveness is about 0.6, which is a higher correlation than the correlation between general cognitive ability and grades. And I use that as an example because that's one of the most robust and powerful findings in the social sciences, whereas the correlation between socioeconomic status and perceived mate attractiveness for women by men is zero or slightly negative. So it's a walloping difference. And That's associated with the proclivity of women to preferentially mate across hierarchies and up, and men to mate across hierarchies and down. That's relatively well-established cross-culturally, and the proclivity doesn't ameliorate much in, say, the Scandinavian countries. It ameliorates slightly. And then there are other hallmarks of attractiveness on the female side, and this is where I want to go with the beauty myth. We know that... um, Babies, for example, will gaze much longer, even as newborns, at symmetrical faces. And there is this doll-like aspect that you described. So one of the hallmarks of sexual attractiveness is neotenic faces. And so there's a proclivity for organisms to evolve towards their juvenile forms. That's neoteny. And it's such a pervasive tendency that it even characterizes animated characters as... uh, Stephen Jay Gould was at pains to establish. It's quite comical. But one of the hallmarks of cuteness is a babyishness of face. And you can see that in the like plush toys and the sorts of things that are often bought as dolls for kids or, or for sentimental adults have very large eyes, very small noses, very symmetrical faces. There's all sorts of hallmarks of beauty from a biological perspective, many of them seem to be associated with fecundity, um, particularly on the female side. And that is very harsh. It's a very, very harsh standard. And when I read The Beauty Myth, which was a long time ago, by the way, because it was published in what, 91? 93, 93, yeah. 93, 93. Um, I was curious about what you made of the biological markers of beauty. And what you, th- how you think that plays into what did you describe the Iron Maiden straitjacket that's placed on women in terms of the what the ideal of their sexual self presentation? Right. So thank you for asking. You may be right. It may actually have been ninety one. Um, came out first in Britain and then in the United States. So respectfully, I'm familiar with these arguments, and uh, respectfully, I'm very familiar with David Buss's work, and I. I think that it's fundamentally flawed, and I'll I'll get to why. Um, so, first, let me concede. Um, you know, of course, uh, it's it's thoroughly documented that <clears throat> there are markers of um, health and attractiveness, uh, health and fertility that are often cross cultural, um, and certainly symmetrical features. Um, you know, rosy skin showing good circulation. You know, youth. Uh, all, all of those are kind of tran- transcendental um, markers for attractiveness. However, one giant intellectual flaw, respectfully, in um, pretty much all of the studies that I've seen of the evolutionary biologists is that they focus on these markers in women and they don't um, test for what women find attractive in men. They they project or they construct kind of experiments or surveys that prove tendentiously, in my view, that women find wealth uh, or professional accomplishment attractive and that that kind of uh, substitutes for physical beauty. But they don't ask women who are heterosexual, um, what are the markers 
for you of beauty in men or attractiveness in men. And if they did, and they don't, they would find broad shoulders, they would find, you know, symmetry, they would find maybe, you know, (laughs) sorry, penis size, Um, you know, they would find maybe a, a, a muscle tone that shows that they can kind of effectively, you know, impregnate a woman. They they would probably find height as a marker, right? And well, they, it's notable well, they, to me. Like they, they, have, they have investigated that. I mean, there is a fair bit of overlap in the biomarkers, let's say, for what men and women find mutually physically attractive. Although the way that's manifested varies to some degree. As you pointed out, shoulder to waist ratio, for example, is a marker, as you can see in superhero portrayals of men, for example. And... The, the 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 cardinal difference seems to be too though it, you know it's also not the sophisticated evolutionary psychologists don't assume that women are after wealth what they assume is that women will use markers of wealth as indicators of productive competence right but to, now, let me so, get there please because to me that's <clears throat> also a conceptual flaw um I'll I'll get to why in just a minute but I know I have to note for the record as a feminist analyst that I have literally never seen a study that asks women if they find penis size a marker for sexual attractiveness. And I think scientists don't want to run that study. Male scientists don't want to run that study because it would be unpopular (laughs) conclusions. Um, So I I guess to me, the whole field of evolutionary biological studies that conclude that um, sexual attractiveness is a, is, is kind of um, gendered female and, uh, and that, for males, their other proxies for sexual attractiveness is really convenient for men um, because they don't have to come up against the raw brute fact that there are, you know, physical things women evaluate men for if they're heterosexual, just like there are physical things men so, evaluate. So, okay, so for let, if me, let me ask you about that a little bit too, because you say that it's convenient for men. And so, I mean, I'm I'm never certain what form of differential perception on the part of each sex is convenient for which sex. I mean, the entire sexual battlefield, let's say, is fraught with catastrophe and opportunity for both sexes. I mean, one of the things you do see, for example, is that women are much harsher in the evaluations of attractiveness of men than men are of women. So women, men rate women, 50% of women, as below, attractive, uh, below average in attractiveness. And women rate 80% of men as below average in physical attractiveness. And well, and and like I am I, I want to be absolutely 100 percent crystal clear here that I am not blaming women for this. I understand why this is, I believe. Now, it's in the interest of a woman, biologically and practically, to find a partner who is as competent as competent as she is, or more competent, because Fundamentally, what she's trying to do is redress the differential burden that reproduction places on women. And so totally the disagree. reason that women... Totally disagree with you. I think that's out of date, respectfully, but I'll wait for you to finish. Okay, well, okay, well, so I'm curious about why you would, why you would consider that, because consider that out of date, because first of all, one of the definitions of what constitutes female biologically is the female sex, biologically speaking, is almost invariably the sex that devotes more biological time and energy to reproduction than the alternative sex. So you see that even at the level of sperm and egg, because the egg has a volume that is multiple thousands of times larger than the sperm. And even at that level, there's more resources being devoted to the difficult job of reproduction at the female level. And of course, women have a nine-month gestation period, which is very onerous, and then they do, they are charged with primary responsibility for infant caregiving, especially during the first year. And we know perfectly well that the differential burden of reproduction on women is such that single women who have a child are much more likely to descend into poverty. And the reason for that, at least in part, is well, it's actually very difficult to have a child, and it's a 40-hour-a-week job at minimum, and to add the necessity of uh, working and providing on top of that means an 80-hour work week. And so it isn't obvious to me why 
the hypothesis that women would be motivated to redress that fundamental biological differential, I don't understand why that would be an objectionable hypothesis, even from the feminist perspective. Well, let Doesn't me... it just recognize that women are more at risk on the sexual and reproductive front? I mean, I recognize what you're saying there. Um, I guess what I would say is there are as many, I like, get, first let me say, I think the whole field of evolutionary biology being presented to explain contemporary 21st century gender roles or expectations or norms is respectfully, uh, I, I think it has almost no intellectual merit. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude. Because you can, I mean, I've read the whole range of evolutionary biologists, biologists who are usually invoked, right? And they're always tendentious and they're always talking about circumstances that no longer exist historically. So, um, you know, you could just as easily draw on, I believe it's Helen Fisher who, uh, or other feminist evolutionary biologists who make the case that um, women are best served by adultery because they're getting um, a, a good range of sperm, you know, and the, the best suited sperm is the, is the sperm that's going to well, that win. Well, that does account for, that does account for, uh, for, for cheating behavior. And most of the evolutionary psychologists who have their act together take that into account is that what the optimal strategy, if you're being cold hearted about it biologically, especially for a woman who hasn't optimized her mate choice, might be to find someone stable and second rate and then to cheat sporadically to produce that biological diversity. And that does seem to be something approximating a stable biological solution, even though I don't right. think it's an optimal one. So right. Well, I let think me, the sophisticated let, evolutionary psychologists have taken that into account. Gotcha. But let me just speak to why that kind of very beloved, and I have to notice that it's beloved, of the whole kind of, you know, Dawkins crowd, the whole selfish gene crowd is, it kind of loves this idea of the young, fertile female who needs to find that unattractive, older, wealthy man um, who happened, happened to be a scientist, a scientist and, 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 and also, you know, a, a, a accounts for or always gives males a kind of, well, you're just polygamous or you just need lots of sexual partners and it's good for, you know, it's good for the reproduction of the race or the species. Um so the reason I find these tendentious and, and especially, you know, this notion of uh, women optimizing the material value of their partner to make up for their reproductive deficits um, is that uh, respectfully, it's, it's out of date. Uh, and what I mean by that is I totally concede that, you know, women, it's hard to be pregnant. It's hard to have a baby. It puts you at a disadvantage. Certainly, um, it's not accounted for in, you know, contemporary work expectations more so since the pandemic when everyone's at home. But, you know, when you had to go to work, obviously it's put women at a disadvantage and they needed a provider for those two years. But I will say that now I think that young men, for instance, like a whole phenomenon that I find fascinating, I might find, I might find it fascinating as an older woman who's married a much younger man, but I, I find it fascinating that when I was writing the beauty myth, older women were considered done reproductively or sexually. And now that's no longer the case. And that there's this whole um, kind of expectation now of young men finding older women who are materially successful and who can, you know, provide them with, with a good lifestyle really attractive. So I think that the evolutionary biologists haven't um, accounted for that. You know, even women past reproductive age who are financially successful are considered really attractive to young men now. So that's a 21st century phenomenon. It never used to exist. And, um, and the other thing that didn't used to exist is if women have enough material resources now, they can hire someone. And I'm not saying this is optimal. It's very sad. I'm with you on the value of the nuclear family. But, you know, if they haven't married someone who can look after them for that brief window when a baby and, you know, a nursing baby uh, is, 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 is impeding your ability to kind of go it on your own. Totally agree with that. Um, they can hire someone to help with those two years. So really the penalties for being a single mom, it's not easy. If you don't have resources, I completely concede you're going to kind of 
go down the, the, the socioeconomic scale. But if you do have resources, that's no longer the case. And that's why you're seeing, you know, so much of what you criticize, um, 21st century economic uh, opportunities have made it possible to be an affluent single mom, hire a caregiver, hire, you know, someone to help you raise the baby, basically, when the baby's tiny. And then starting from three years old, you know, there are, there are child care centers, daycare centers that will take the baby. And so I think the evolutionary biologists haven't accounted for what is going to result from that. It's what we've seen result from it, which is, I'm sorry to be rude, but the value of men has gone down. And I think that respectfully, that's one of the things I think is most, most useful about your work. Respectfully, I've been thinking about this. I think that's why you've been so targeted by the establishment is that you talk about the value of men and you talk about, you know, how men can be relevant in and consider themselves to be relevant and have a role in 21st century society. So I think the great unspoken or under-analyzed phenomenon of the 21st century is the deconstruction of the value of men, um, which completely upends the evolutionary biologist's kind of narrative about men and women. And, you know, respectfully to kind of end on a happy note, I do think the value of your work is that you're trying to give men and succeeding in a lot of ways a, a role in 21st century society in which they they do have um they do have value 